This morning, it's my honor to introduce Father Jeremy Driscoll. Father Driscoll was ordained a priest in 1981 as a Benedictine monk of Mount, Abbey, Mount Angel Abbey in Oregon. In 1983, he earned his STL in patristics from the Augustinianum and an STD from the Pontifical Athenaeum San Anselmo in Rome. Father Jeremy has the gift of bilocation special feature that he has, since that he teaches both at Mount Angel Seminary in Oregon and at San Anselmo in Rome. In 2004, he was named an associate member of the Pontifical Academy of Theology, and in 2010, he was named an ordinarius of the same academy. In 2005, he was appointed by Blessed Pope John Paul II as a consultor to the Congregation for Divine Worship, an appointment which was renewed by Pope Benedict XVI. In 2011, the Catholic University of America awarded Father Jeremy with the prestigious Johannes Quasten Medal for Theological Excellence. In 2012, Pope Benedict named him as a consultor to the Pontifical Council for promoting the new evangelization, as well as a preface to the Synod of Bishops on the new evangelization in October of 2012. Father Jeremy has published many works, uh, both articles and books, some of which are listed in the program. And he will speak to us this morning on catechesis and doctrine in liturgical preaching. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Father Jeremy. Thank you, Archbishop. And it's a real privilege for me to be here with you. The title of this presentation, which the Archbishop just announced, uh, signed me by the organizers of the conference, but agreed to by me, <laughs> may perhaps seem overburdened. Catechesis, doctrine, liturgical preaching. These are big topics and I'm meant to fit them all together. But I actually believe that is achievable. I will suggest to you that placing these three important topics in relation to each other is one of the distinctive contributions of preaching the mystery of faith. It is precisely in this that it builds on fulfilled in your hearing. Early critics of the new document complained that it was repudiating the precious gains achieved through fulfilled in your hearing, a document which unquestionably exercised an influence that shaped Catholic preachers in such a way that they felt required to speak in substantial ways about the scriptural texts assigned to the Mass of the day. It also offered effective means for preparing such homilies. There's no need to be nervous if 30 years later, uh, the bishops discern a need to build on these gains. Surely they are right to note the changed circumstances in which the Church in the United States finds itself some 30 years later. They note especially the need to engage in a new evangelization called for so insistently by Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI. The implications and requirements of the new evangelization will naturally affect preaching in a significant way. The bishops note as well that our country has grown increasingly more culturally diverse in the last 30 years. It is precisely here the new evangelization and culturally diverse context that the bishops articulate the way they want to build on the gains of fulfilled in your hearing. And it is here at the very outset of their document that we hear them putting catechesis, doctrine, and liturgy all together. It's the text you have on the board. They say the church's rich theological, doctrinal, and catechetical tradition must therefore properly inform the preaching task in its liturgical setting. For Jesus Christ must be proclaimed in a new way and with new urgency. And the Sunday liturgy remains the most basic setting in which most, most adult Catholics encounter Christ in their Catholic faith. Note that the bishops are not simply saying here, more catechesis and doctrine and homilies. Again, as some early critics and nervous headlines in Catholic publications complained when the document was issued. In the passage just cited here, uh, 
they say that these must inform the task of preaching. They connect this to preaching's liturgical context and express their desire to spell out some of the implications of this connection. Doing this well and with sufficient detail is of course a task bigger than a document of this sort can achieve, but the document offers clear directions for development. And I present my own reading of it here as an indication of some of those directions which I very much welcome. I want to follow the document's suggestion on how catechesis and doctrine can inform the preaching task. And I want to take note of the document's repeated attention to the liturgical context of which a good preacher must remain ever mindful. Indeed, insistence on attention to this liturgical context is one of the distinctive contributions of preaching the mystery of faith. Nothing is lost here of the emphasis on scriptural preaching associated with fulfilled in your hearing, but much is gained, for the scriptures themselves expand into the sacramental presence of the Lord himself when proclaimed in the liturgical context. Catechesis and doctrine inform the task of the one who must point to all this in preaching. <coughs> I will follow here the document's discussion in two of its chapters, the first devoted to the biblical foundations and the second to liturgical preaching. I should say at the outset that I do not intend to offer here practical strategies for constructing particular homilies. Rather, I want to think with you about the deep structures that would undergird such strategies. I think that that is what is being offered in the two chapters I will examine. Biblical foundations. The document's opening chapter on biblical foundations can serve to answer those who suggest that somehow the bishops are retreating from biblically based preaching. This chapter is a sturdy, if brief, biblical theological presentation of the mystery of God who reveals himself through his creative and powerful word. We heard about this yesterday from Father Donald Sr. For our purposes now, I want to draw attention to two important moments in this rich chapter. First, after looking at a number of the ways, at a number of examples of the way the Gospels insistently portray, consistently portray the divine power of Jesus' words, an important distinction is drawn. The bishops say, even so, there is a difference in kind between the preaching of Jesus and the preaching of the apostles. Jesus, though bearing testimony to the Father, also bears testimony to himself. The apostles, for their part, bear testimony not to themselves, but to Jesus. He, indeed, becomes the principal content of their preaching. I think this distinction is of critical importance in conceiving the homilist task. Even if the homilist has much to gain from observing Jesus' own preaching, and the document offers us many examples, it is Jesus himself in all the mystery of his risen existence that forms the basic content of the apostolic preaching. The very same preaching for which bishops, priests, and deacons are all ordained till this present day. The document draws a distinction, or draws a con connection rather, between the apostolic preaching and Pentecost showing that the relationship between the risen Lord and the spirit that he pours out are vital. Two key texts that succinctly demonstrate what the spirit achieves in us are cited. In 1 Corinthians 12, 3, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 4, 6, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. On the basis of these texts and the developments that precede them in the scriptures, the documents formulate a very useful point of focus. It says, this defines the preacher's task, enabling the whole community and each individual believer to draw on the power of the spirit and to say with one's whole being, 
Jesus is Lord, and to cry out to God, Abba, Father. The document does not explicitly say so here, but it is useful for our purposes to observe that in this focus statement there are implications and indications for how catechesis and doctrine and liturgy all relate to one another in preaching. Jesus is Lord is an enormously potent biblical condensation of what unfolds from the whole mystery of his death and resurrection. In that phrase is contained his humanity, Jesus, his divinity, Lord, the Father who glorifies him, and the Spirit who enables us to utter this phrase with understanding. Abba Father condenses the entire being of the Divine Son into a name that the Son utters from all eternity, a name he utters throughout his earthly life, a name he utters as he breathes his last on the cross, a name he utters as he gives unceasing thanks and glory to his Father for the resurrection. And this same name is placed on our lips from the depths of Jesus' risen being by the Spirit he pours out on us. Nowhere does this happen so forcefully or more completely than when the church gathers for the liturgy. Doctrine correctly, correctly unfolds these potent condensations and points us to the manifold riches that might otherwise escape us. Catechesis explains them in ways that can be grasped by those not professionally trained in doctrine's intricacies. It does not do so all at once, but patiently, bit by bit, as occasion and context warrant. Liturgy is the context in which we experience that doctrines and the content of catechesis are not abstract ideas to be mastered, but rather a description of the very event of liturgy itself. Liturgy is the whole community and each individual believer saying Jesus is Lord and Abba, Father. The insight of the document at this point can be thought of as a sort of template for the preacher. Obviously, in different ways, according to the many different liturgical settings and the scriptural readings involved, one does not mechanically say in every homily, Jesus is Lord and Abba, Father. But there is a way in which that is what is ultimately happening in the community celebration of the Eucharist. And the preacher is helped in conceiving his task by his awareness of this. We will see more about this in other parts of the document. The second part of this chapter on biblical foundations to which I wish to draw attention is the use it makes of Luke's account of the risen Lord's encounter with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. It introduces its reflection by referring to the passage as providing powerful insights into the ministry of liturgical preaching. Four points are developed, only one of which we will look at here. The one entitled, The Sunday Homily as Integral to the Eucharist. It says, the Emmaus account illuminates the interpretation of the two dimensions of the Eucharistic liturgy. Jesus' explanation of the scriptures, the liturgy of the word, leads to an intense experience of communion with the risen Christ, the liturgy of the Eucharist. And the very vividness of the latter brings about a deeper appreciation of the former, were not our hearts burning within us. The point of the interpenetration of the two dimensions of the Eucharistic liturgy is very important for the homilist to consider and it will be developed further in the next chapter on liturgical preaching. It's enough for us to note at present, as the document itself does, that this connection forms part of the biblical foundations of preaching. That is to say that it is not simply part of, it is not simply the bishops in a mood to add greater emphasis to the Eucharist rather than to the scriptures. The scriptures themselves attest to this interpenetration. The document further reminds us of Vatican II's insistence in Sacrosanctum Concilium that the homily is an integral part of the Eucharist itself. 
The homily corresponds to Jesus' explanation of the scriptures in the Emmaus account in reference to the mystery of his own death and resurrection. But the manner and content of his explanation prepare as well for his being recognized in the breaking of the bread. And this would correspond to the homeless doing the same. That is why it is preferable, the bishops say, that the celebrant of the Eucharist also be the homilist. The effective homeless holds these two parts of the liturgy together by being active in both parts. In his reflections that prepare for the homily, the homeless can anticipate, in order to suggest for the congregation, ways in which the Eucharist might shed its light backwards, as it were, onto the experience of the word itself. Were not our hearts burning within us? even as he can point from the word ahead to the more intense encounter with the Lord in the breaking of the bread. This first chapter on the biblical foundation for the church's preaching ministry ends on this extended development of the Emmaus account, only one of which dimensions I have considered with you just now. It could be described as offering a strong paschal focus on all that is said about these biblical foundations. This opens naturally then on to the next chapter titled The Ministry of Liturgical Preaching. It is not enough to say, as some exaggerated defenses of fulfilled in your hearing do, that a homily must be about the scriptural readings of the day. That is certainly true, but these readings have a context the liturgy. And the next chapter of our document wants to unfold and explore this context. I will try to summarize here some of that exploration and say why I think it is significant. First, the Christological foundation of the homily. The chapter opens with what from a theological point of view could be described as a very strong beginning in a section titled the Christological foundation of the homily, is worth being sure that we secure all that is being said here. The opening sentence cuts to the chase. The death and resurrection of Jesus, the culmination and heart of Jesus' mission of revealing God's love for the world, is the central act of our salvation. The bishops immediately connect this forceful and clear statement to St. Paul's foundational text in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4, where Paul delivers to the Corinthian community what he considers to be the heart of the tradition that he himself had received. Paul is cited here as saying, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And so the bishops affirm, the homilist then must again and again put into relief this according to the scriptures of the death and resurrection of Jesus and its meaning for our lives. In fact, the Bible is a huge and vast book. And now with the beautiful lectionary, that is the fruit of the liturgical reform in our times, Catholic communities, precisely by celebrating Sunday and weekday Eucharist, are exposed over time to every major genre of this rich literature and to all of its key passages. The homilist is in principle responsible for speaking about all of them. And in effect, what the bishops are offering here is a clear sense of where the center of this vast book lies. Their claim is a theological one, full of consequences for preaching. They say, every scriptural text on which the homilist preaches leads to that center and sheds light on the mystery of that principal deed of God, the death and resurrection, from different biblical perspectives. Those perspectives fall into different categories, categories that correspond to the three scriptural readings read at Sunday Eucharist. They are Israel's history, the first reading, 
on Apostles' Theological Reflection, the second reading, and the perspective of a particular evangelist, the Gospel reading. The Gospel, of course, is the center of the scriptures, and the liturgy makes this clear by the manner in which it is read, the place, the gestures, and the symbols that accompany it, and the ordained minister that proclaims it. And the bishops describe an evangelist as one who speaks of the life of Jesus in such a way as to show its climax in his death and resurrection. In the several sentences of the document I have cited here, we should note that the bishops are expressing in concise form momentous and complex decisions that the Christian community achieved in the first several centuries of its existence as it brought the scriptures together into the canonical form in which we have known and read them ever since. The Christian community reads Israel's scriptures as her own precisely because and only because her risen Lord showed in them what referred to him in all the scriptures precisely because and only because he showed through these scriptures that it was necessary that Christ should suffer these things and so enter into his glory. The Christian community reads the apostolic letters, generally the second reading, the fundamental theological moves that show how to read the scriptures in this way and show us this clear center. Typical of this is Paul's clear creedal statement cited at the beginning of this development. And finally, the Christian community reads in the gospel not simply edifying stories about Jesus in his earthly life, but she follows the different paths that four gospels take us to one same clear climax in his death and resurrection. So the bishops are standing on very solid theological ground when they conclude this first part of the chapter by claiming, thus the person and mission of Jesus culminating in his death and resurrection is ultimately the central content of all the scriptures. So yes, indeed, the homilists must speak about the scriptural readings of the day but in such a way as to show how they lead to this central content. The homily on the Eucharist. As you will have noticed, the extended meditation on the risen Lord's appearance to the disciples on the road to Emmaus that ended the first chapter of our document has been carried over into the chapter we are considering now. Together with 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4, it forms the biblical foundation for the claim about central content. In the next section of this chapter, by following the natural development of the same Emmaus account, the essential connection between scripture, the homily, and the Eucharist is developed. The bishops rightly note that it was only in the breaking of the bread that the disciples ultimately recognized their risen Lord and likewise only then that they realized that their hearts were burning within them while he explained the scriptures. That is to say, there is a sense in which the experience of Eucharist casts its force backwards to the liturgy of the word, revealing only now in the Eucharist how much was already present in the scriptures. And wanting to secure this wonderful connection, the bishops offer a very explicit directive, and in doing so, are certainly wanting to push preaching in a new direction by this document. They say, this is why virtually every homily preached during the liturgy should make some connection between the scriptures just heard and the Eucharist about to be celebrated. I welcomed this statement, but to my surprise, the string of conversation that I followed on one of the early and critical blogs took a number of cynical snipes at it. It's just enough, I think, to read the next sentence of the document to realize that this does not intend that all homilies will have Eucharist as their central content or subject. It, the next sentence says, depending on what opportunities the texts in question provide, such a connection might be very brief or only 
implicitly indicated, but at other times a firm connection should be established and drawn out. The way in which the bishops explain this point further can be considered another template for structuring a homily. They connect the center of the scriptures, which they have just articulated as being the death and resurrection of Jesus, with what the Eucharist is, namely the memorial of the Lord's death, during the course of which we recognize that the Lord has truly been raised. That's their words, not mine. I call this a template because it can serve as a deep structure to any homily preached during the Eucharist. A deep structure whose details allow any number of variations. In commenting on the readings, the center of death and resurrection can be indicated in the terms that the texts provide. And with those images and images from other parts of the liturgy, that same center can be indicated in the Eucharist about to be celebrated. As the bishops say, this can be done briefly or at times only implicitly suggested, but at other times a firm connection should be de developed, especially when the text and the celebration in question provide the opportunity. The point is not to burden a single homily with an explicit expression of all these perspectives. It is rather to provide a pattern or a template for homilies preached over time. The directive they are providing here expresses what the bishops hope for their churches. They say, when this connection is consistently made clear to the Christian people, they will understand the scriptures and the mystery of the Eucharist ever more deeply. At the end of this development on the homily's relation to Eucharist, the bishops admit that they are describing a challenging project for the homilists. And so, in encouragement, they draw attention to two things on which homilists should rely. The grace of ordination and the great tradition of preaching that belongs to the whole church. This is not a throwaway remark. Attention to ordination is attention drawn to the Holy Spirit poured out on the one ordained. The Spirit, as the ultimate author of the scriptures, who spoke through the prophets, as the creed has it, helps the mind of the preacher to perceive how the thousands of strands of the scriptures lead to one same center. And the same Spirit helps him to articulate this with clarity, force, and conviction. This is the same spirit whom the preacher's same lips will implore the Father to send down for the transformation of the gifts that the people will bring to his hands immediately following his preaching. And neither is attention drawn to the tradition of preaching a throwaway phrase. The bishops are not articulating a new pattern of preaching here. There are great models of the pattern of preaching that they describe, especially in the patristic tradition, and here especially in the patristic mystagogical catechesis. But, and here is something that we seldom think about in these terms, never so much as in our times, in the entire history of the church, has such a rich lectionary of readings been available to such a large number of believers. If the tradition provides a pattern or template, our times provide more texts than ever before and a variety of circumstances in which to employ and exercise this pattern. The call to new evangelization here is now opening the door to an immense field of possibility. Taking seriously the patterns and templates that the bishops offer, taking it seriously, we could create a new moment in the history of preaching in the church. We could trust that the Holy Spirit who inspires the new evangelization will also create in hearts open to the Spirit's continual pondering of the deep things of God, something great and new in our times from out of our own widely varying and changing circumstances. This is why 
mention of theological studies here, which comes next in the document, is not a throwaway phrase. The bishops say, the homeless theological studies were geared toward helping them move knowledgeably among the scriptures and to understand deeply the sacraments which are so intimately joined to the scriptures. This may be a sleeper sentence. If the style of the document were less formal, they might have written next, hint, hint. <laughs> the bishops are expressing an expectation here and a measure of how we study scripture and theology in our seminary in preparation for ordination and an expectation of how we continue those studies after ordination. It is not enough to study the Bible in the purely academic approach that today divides biblical studies into many fields of specialization. The church's Bible, the lectionary, must also be studied for the theological positions that are expressed in its structure, its combination of readings, and the presupposition of the context of the celebration of the Eucharist that will follow upon these texts proclaimed and preached. It is time now to turn to the other big words stuffed into the title of my presentation, doctrine and catechesis. These words form part of the title of the next section in this chapter's discussion of the ministry of liturgical preaching. The title is The Sunday Homily, Doctrine and the Church's Catechesis. Still sticking close to the biblical text for the development of the ideas they want to put forward, the bishops begin here with a passage from St. Paul in which they discern what they call, these are their words, the intrinsic relationship between preaching, doctrine, and catechesis. They cite Romans 10, 13 to 16 as the basis for this development. You will recognize the text as soon as I began to read it, but as I do so, I will interrupt my reading indicating the points at which doctrine, catechesis, and preaching each are at issue in what is being said. St. Paul begins himself by citing scripture for the point he wants to make about Jesus. As such, we have once again a legitimization of the pattern of Christological interpretation that the bishops are building up here. In any case, Paul says, for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This actually is a doctrinal question. Not doctrine as abstract ideas about God floated at random, but a position taken on where salvation can actually be had. The verse quoted in the document builds on Paul's previous remark a few verses earlier, not quoted in the document. Namely, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Doctrine here means the line of thought that understands this divine arrangement that protects it from any backsliding interpretations, that precludes understandings that would contradict it. Catechesis would be delivering this content in such a way that people can put their belief in it. Thus the citation of Paul is continued with, and how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Obviously, the hearing spoken of here is more than the sound of words knocking against the eardrums. It's the kind of hearing that enables belief in a precise content. Enabling belief in a precise content that saves. That is not a bad description of the catechetical task. But let us hear now the next sentence of the citation that makes an explicit connection of all this with preaching. St. Paul continues, and how can they hear without someone to preach? And how can people preach unless they are sent? After this opening and noting that Paul's letters were most likely read in the liturgical assemblies of the early Christian communities, this section offers a number of examples from the letters of Paul that illustrate what sort of questions the bishops have in mind when they speak of doctrine here. <clears throat> 
Once again, the point of this center is driven home. For Paul, they say, the heart of his apostolic preaching is the mystery of Christ, especially the central mystery of the death and resurrection of Christ. They go on to say, or to point out, Paul's purpose is to draw his hearers into full awareness of the depth of that mystery into which they have already been plunged through baptism. We should hold on to that phrase, full awareness of the depth of the mystery, as indicating part of what the bishops are concerned about when they speak of doctrines and catechesis entering into preaching. Another phrase that gives a sense of what is at issue is the phrase, an impact on the totality of Christian life. Listen to that phrase in this next citation. But Paul also spends considerable times in his letters illustrating how faith in Christ and participation in the life of the church have an impact on the totality of Christian life, offering, as it were, an extended catechetical presentation for his communities. It is a question of spelling out what kind of behavior life in Christ demands. If in this document the bishops are urging homilists to work on building up in their congregation a full awareness of the depth of the mystery, and if they want preaching to indicate how faith in Christ must have an impact on the totality of Christian life, and if they use the words doctrine and catechesis to designate these dimensions, then surely what is urged in this section must be taken to heart by homilists. The bishops are careful to preclude misunderstandings or even caricatures of the type of preaching they are calling for. They clarify. Certainly doctrine is not meant to be propounded in a homily in the way that it might unfold in a theology classroom or a lecture for an academic audience or even a catechism lesson. The homily is integral to the liturgical act of the Eucharist and the language and spirit of the homily should fit that context. Again, the point is not to burden every single homily with all of these dimensions but rather to include them as dimensions that regularly appear. Thus, the bishops say, over time, the homilus, while respecting the unique form and spirit of the Sunday homily, should communicate the full scope of this rich catechetical teaching to his congregation. There is, in fact, already in place the structure for achieving this full scope of teaching over time. It is the liturgical year. This is the deep structure and is integral to the meaning of every particular celebration of the Eucharist. The bishops see that awareness of this is how a homilus can bring together into a coherent whole a number of strands. Scripture passages, the relation of these to the context of Eucharist, and bringing to light the requirements of Christian belief and life are all based on this. All this, they say, should be keyed to the seasons of the liturgical year. I would have made more of this point than the document does. In any case, enough is said here to indicate what would definitely be a fruitful direction for development. If the goal is to communicate over time the full scope of the depth of the mystery and its impact on the totality of Christian life, we are not in need of somebody drawing up a program of how this might be achieved in an, order an orderly and systematic plan of preaching. The liturgical year is this plan. The liturgical year with the meaning of its seasons and feasts with the scriptures that are already in place for these, with the prayers that are proper to the different feasts. At the center of the liturgical year stands the same center that this document has insisted on as the central content of the scripture, namely the death and resurrection of Jesus. Around this center, 
around the Paschal Triduum radiate all the other mysteries of Christ, just as weeks and months of the church at prayer lead up to that celebration, and just as weeks and months of the church at prayer flow from it. This is the overtime in which the bishops hope that the full scope of the mystery will be exposed to the Christian people. The development here on doctrine is quite ample and as such indicates, I think, a new thrust that the bishops wish to give to preaching by this document. They have already made clear that they do not have in mind learned academic presentations of doctrines. Rather, doctrines play a role in guiding and shaping how the homilist approaches his task. They say, the doctrines of the church should direct the homilist and ensure that he arrives at and preaches about what is in fact the deepest meaning of scripture and sacrament for Christian life. Note that in this formulation, the bishops are refusing to let a wedge be driven between scripture and doctrine. They continue, for doctrines simply formulate with accuracy what the church, prompted by the gift of the Spirit, has come to know through the scriptures proclaimed in the believing assembly and through the sacraments that are celebrated on the foundation of these scriptures. Without saying so here, the bishops are relying on the well-known dynamic of lex orandi, lex credendi. Doctrines, lex credendi, are formulated on the basis of the church's encounter with Christ, especially in the Eucharistic liturgy, the lex orandi. The Eucharist, that is, scriptures and sacrament bound up in a single celebration and hopefully preached about as such. What doctrines do the bishops have in mind? They say, the most central mysteries of our faith, the Trinity, the Incarnation, and the redemption that Christ reveals in his Paschal sacrifice were all attested in the scriptures and proclaimed and celebrated in the Eucharist. Such doctrines, it is explained, were formulated to keep Christian communities that were scattered across the world in a same communion about understanding rightly the scriptures read and the Eucharist celebrated. For that reason, the bishops urge, these doctrines ought to be seamlessly introduced and articulated still today in the course of our liturgical celebrations. In order to ensure that by reading the scriptures and celebrating the Eucharist, we understand ever more deeply the essential beliefs of the church. As they come to the end of this extended development on the doctrine and catechesis in preaching, the bishops offer yet another template. Template is my word for this. Uh, another template for structuring a homily, a pattern that would allow for multiple variation. They suggest connecting some point of the homily to a phrase or key idea of the creed, since at Sunday Eucharist, the creed will be professed immediately after the homily. There need be nothing artificial about doing this, for as the bishops note, the creed has the same center that the scriptures and the Eucharist have. Then they offer an example of this pattern, a pattern that could be built upon in any number of ways depending on the scriptures of the day and also perhaps on the feast in question. They say the center of the creed and of scripture and of Eucharist is that the one Lord Jesus Christ suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. But this Jesus is true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. The homilus proclaims and teaches that this is the one who came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. This is the one whom we see moving about, speaking and acting in the Gospels. This is the one who suffered death and was buried and rose again. To great effect, the bishops conclude this suggestion about the creed by citing St. Cyril of Jerusalem. The last sentence, the most, this is St. Cyril, the most important doctrines 
were collected from the whole of scripture to make a single exposition of the faith. This development is concluded by posing and answering a question. The bishops ask, so when all is said and done, why should the homilist preach doctrinally and catechetically? Because as Paul and the evangelists knew, the people are drawn to Jesus and his gospel by the beauty and truth of the mysteries of our faith. Beauty and truth. Those need to be realities that are first experienced by the one entrusted with the responsibility of preaching. That point is the last word in this section. Of course, what is essential for speaking about the mysteries of our faith with passion and conviction is that the preacher himself grasps the doctrinal significance of their truth and so loves these mysteries himself that he can communicate that love and truth to his listeners. It is clear that these words are an appeal. Taken with the seriousness they deserve, they become a real call for renewal in the hearts and minds of those who preach. Again, here is where the new evangelization directly affects preaching. A preacher in love with the mysteries. A preacher who tells of his love with passion and conviction. A conclusion. I hope I have dealt extensively, even if not exhaustively, with what is said in Preaching the Mystery of Faith about doctrine and catechesis in liturgical preaching. I bring my reading of the document to an end now, not with the end of the document itself, for it still will treat other topics, the one ordained to preach and practical questions about interpreting the scriptures and preparing the homily. Instead, I can conclude here the topic assigned to me by noting the well-worded reminder with which this longest chapter of the document on the ministry of preaching ends. Its last section is titled, The Homily as an Ecclesial Act. Precisely because the homily occurs in the context of the church's liturgy, they say, the bishops, it is by definition a profound ecclesial act. It is directed from faith to faith, from the faith of the church and the one ordained to preach to the faith of the Christian community gathered in a spirit of prayer and praise in the presence of Christ. The movement from faith to faith is what the bishops have wanted to strengthen in this document. They have expressed in a fresh way and with the emphasis they deem important what the faith of the church is concerning the scriptures when read in the context of the Sunday Eucharist and what the implications are for the one who preaches in this context. They have likewise expressed how they hope the faith will grow in the Christian people who hear such preaching. Preaching, they say, this is the text you have in front of you, preaching, they say, is a sacred ecclesial act meant to lead from the biblical word to the Eucharistic action and thereby to nourish faith and build up the body of Christ gathered in prayer. I have suggested at several key points in this talk that what the bishops are suggesting in this document, if taken to heart, could open a new phase in the history of preaching in our time. Something new and great could happen which would answer to the changed circumstances that were noted at the outset of this document, namely the call to a new evangelization in a culturally diverse context. I am well aware that this document can be criticized for sounding that it, like it was written by a committee, and in fact it was. But a more theological name for that would be to call it a collegial effort a collegial effort that tries to draw together the concerns of several hundred bishops in our beautiful, complicated, and richly blessed nation. <clears throat>
of course there are some bumps and thuds in the presentation of the whole. But it would be wrong to use occasional infelicities in the presentation of the whole as an excuse to ignore what I judge to be a very significant effort on the part of our bishops. They are calling for a much deeper, a much more vital kind of preaching. They want preaching to trace and tell how the scriptural words become flesh in the sacraments that the community celebrates in their hearing and how the divine life of these sacraments becomes the very life of the community itself. They want this movement unfolded in all its truth and beauty so that the community will be drawn to live by its consequences. They want that, these are the last words of the document, we who are ordained to preach the Sunday homily like Mary, who brought the incarnate word into the world, may conform our lives to her son and proclaim effectively the word of salvation to all. Thank you very much for your attention.